uh, it, it's pretty crammed. I'm going to go through at a rate of knots, so please forgive it. Sacred geography, we'll look at some different types of sacred geography. Um, and what is sacred geography? Good question. Uh, what sacred geography is, it's the meeting of physical landscape, topography, and the human mind and spirit and soul, whatever you want, geographies of the soul, if you like. And it's a meeting of those two elements. And as I shall say at the end, with a dramatic picture, that we, um, what, what ancient peoples did, they invested their landscape with meaning. And uh, as a, generally, as a culture, we don't do that now. But I'll come back to that. Magical mindscapes, uh, sacred geography, however you want to describe it. Um, the um, most sacred geographies, plural, are uh, either visual and, or auditory or a bit of both, but they can use other sensory things, and I'll just mention this in passing. <laughs> uh, for example, on this uh, Sawieki in one, on one of the Fijian islands, there's a sacred place, it's a beach. And uh, the sand smells like vanilla. And because of that scent, natural scent there, it became imbued with, with meaning, with uh, spiritual significance. So there can be many things that will trigger a sacred geography. But I thought we'd look at about seven or eight different types of sacred geography. Uh, the first being what I call the topography of myth venerated natural places, uh, because the first geographies, the first sacred geography, if you like, was the unadulterated land itself. And people living in different landscapes would gravitate towards particular features in the landscape, which they would imbue with the sacred, where they would go and get a sense of the numinous. And, um, and these were the first sacred places. Uh, Levi Brule, said of the Australian or Australasian Aborigine, the land is a living book in which the myths are inscribed. A legend is captured in the very outlines of the landscape. And as I say, he was saying that about Australasian Aboriginal peoples, uh, but he could have said it about any Aboriginal peoples anywhere in the world. Their myths, they lived amongst their mythic imagery. Okay, what sort of sites would acquire this numinous power or have a numinous power that attracted people? Well, we'll start right where we are. What was a good idea? Uh, landmarks, various types of landmarks, things that stuck out in the landscape would naturally attract the attention of people living in those landscapes. And we know here at Glastonbury, I mean, the tour is quite a distinctive landmark and becomes the focus for myth and legends. And we all know that sort of soft numinosity that occurs here. And uh, it has a magical, the Isle of Avalon and all the rest of it. I'll tell you an interesting legend is associated. I mean, it was the last, supposedly the last place uh, for the king of the fairies. Uh, it was the entrance to Anun the Celtic underworld or other world. But there's an interesting feature you may or may not know about, but you know Cadbury Castle is about 12 miles away, believed to be the site of the actual historical Camelot. Uh, but on the, uh, there's a legend, it certainly goes back to the 15th century and possibly much, much older. Geoffrey Ash said it's much older. Um, that says that King Arthur will ride out of Cadbury Castle and uh, lead the wild host. And you know the legend of the wild host. It's all over Europe in, in medieval and early medieval and even earlier times. The idea of a, a furious, furious host of spirits led by some charismatic a god, a hero figure, a goddess, whatever, and they would whoosh through the landscape, picking up anybody that was very ill or on their deathbeds or whatever, 
and take the souls with them. And indeed, this was greatly feared in, in medieval times. And there are actual instructions of how not to be taken by the wild host. And in case you need to know, and ever in that position, you lie on your back and you cross your arms like that, like some Egyptian pharaoh. Uh, and they might pass over with a bit of luck. Close your eyes, by the way. So uh, it shoots over you. And they, what they did here, between Cadbury Castle, they went to the Tor to deliver the souls they picked up to the mouth of Annan. So they delivered to the underworld. And King Arthur was, was at the head. So it's at least half a millennium old, that legend, and maybe much older. Now, what's interesting, uh, archaeological digs on Cadbury Castle have revealed, you know, the remains of uh, sort of uh, what might have been the old Camelot, a great fortified structure and citadel. But in the last few years, they, they excavated a burial site of early Bronze Age, much older, much older, sort of 2000 BC, 1800 BC. And it was the burial of a large male, and had his bones there, and he was buried in a ritual boat. And it was on the side of Cadbury Castle that faces uh, the Tor, which is perfectly visible on the skyline. Uh, so it's a landmark. And the prow of this boat, the pointy end, pointed to the Tor. So it looked like, and, and if, you, if you remember the, the legends, the romances, the Arthurian romances, that the, the dying Arthur is put in a fairy bark and taken to the, the land of immortal souls. And uh, one can only wonder if that early Bronze Age burial of this very tall fellow uh, was really where that element of the Arthurian romances began long, long ago, thousands of years ago. It's known that there's Iron Age mythology encoded in the Arthurian romance, but my guess is it goes back further. But anyway, so the wild host runs down there. You've got this curious archaeological linkage pointing to the top. And in fragments along the way of the wild host, there are actual old trackways, sections of trackways, that mark out exactly the same course. So we get a sense that there's a multi-layered mythological patina over this landscape that relates to this particular landmark. And then we know what the Christians did. Uh, and there they are. Um, so it's, it's natural places, venerated places, attracted uh, the attention of early peoples. And, and through the ages, mythological filters built over them. Another type of sacred, natural sacred place, of course, were, were sacred peaks. This is just an excuse to show this painting by Nicholas Rurick. Beautiful, it always fascinates me. Um, what do we have? Sacred peaks. Oh, Mount Shasta, California, Northern California. It's a sacred uh, peak to the Wintu Indi Indians who live in the territory. And their, their tradition is that when you die, your soul travels to the peak of uh, Mount Shasta, and then off to heaven. And there's a secret geography around here. There are little rocks set up on perching on the edges of cliffs and so on. They are markers, and they're markers for the soul of dead people, so they can find them and um, get find their way. Similar ideas in Oceania. Uh, Kiribati has places where the soul goes in a straight line to the place of dread, and that's a marked route through the landscape. Other examples of, of, of sacred peaks, um, Mount Siloritis, the old Mount Ida in Crete, the temple palace of Phaistos, the lines to it, and there's a whole thing about cleft or saddle peaks um, uh, in, in Crete, or in Greece generally. Uh, and these are uh, significant features. You see there's a sort of black hole there. That's the sacred cave of Kamara.